Dear friends, this is an emergency message from ABR on the subject that you can see everywhere. The pandemic of the coronavirus. And of course, the, the thing that is most interesting to us is the cerebral palsy and coronavirus relationship. How is it going to apply and affect the situation with your children? There's a lot of different things which have been written and said from dismissal and conspiracy theories to full-blown panic. So we have to find the right rational ground and to help you to make informed decisions. Because so far, what you see, even if you go for the trusted sources, anyway, the statistics is going by ages, say, regular people. So the question for us is how we would convert that information into the situation applicable to the children with cerebral palsy. And just to make an extra note, you can see or you can hear we have a parallel Spanish translation because English and Spanish are being two major languages of ABR. And since this is an emergency message, we're not going to separate and edit those things out. So I hope for those of you who are English language based, this additional pauses necessary for Spanish translation would actually help you to get better understanding and digestion. So let's move on. So the plan for today. First point that we're going to cover, understanding the situation. So how the existent statistics and what would be the basis of converging or converting that into the cerebral palsy meaningful things. And just to give you the basic idea, we shouldn't go by age, we should go by fragility. Stronger are usually younger in the overall population and older are more fragile. So when we look at the cerebral palsy, milder cases are more robust and the more severe cases are more fragile. So once we understand the statistics and the fragility part and compare the unknown new coronavirus situation to the well-known typical situation of the regular flus, then we would be in the position to make some conclusions and choose strategies. Whether it's going to be some defensive kind of escaping strategy or whether it's going to be a proactive but temporary strategy where you would get the extra focus with the ABR tools on the respiratory con condition and the quality of that. Or even going further and using this current situation as a wake-up call to give you a serious review of the overall like big global strategy of your channel's development and rehabilitation life that you live with them. And then we'll move to the action plans. So discussing the specific respiratory things that we actually which makes sense to do within that kind of challenging period. So kind of getting the that focus into your ABR program and then from that level broadening whether you know what the action plan could be for the global relaxogenic approach to maximize the recovery potential of a child and then going even further again towards the change of the total strategic and systemic approach to your child's development. So let's start. We start with understanding this coronavirus 19 situation. I brought the numbers. I know that most of you don't really like the numbers, would get bored with them. So, but just to get the basic. See, so far, knowledge from the accumulated Chinese cases and some of the European ones give this type of number. Young children are almost excluded. For the adults under 40, the mortality rate is 0.2%, from 40-50, 0.4. 50 to 60, 1.3, 60 to 70, 3.6, and then 70, 80, it's about 8%, and then past 80, it's 14.8%. So that's so-called mortality per case, you know, like for the cases. Obviously, that's not coming out of the general population, out of the people who contracted the disease. So you can see that these numbers, they dramatically grow. So 0 0.2 versus 14.8, it's like 30 times difference. And what I invite you to see here is the change of fragility from the younger age to the older age. What is fragility in that sense? Because you see there are three ways to look at the situation with this coronavirus. So first thing would be to blame this particular virus itself. But fact is, virus itself doesn't kill. 
what is the main cause of the mortality like. are the specific conditions like pneumonia, kidney failure and so on. So effectively, from the first thing, the virus itself, we have to move to the understanding that it's those diseases which are, have more familiar names, or to be precise, not even diseases, but conditions and situations that cause the mortality and the critical condition. But what are those situations? Those are crises. So, in fact, even more, we can say that those are the situations when the entire system goes into a shock, exposing its weakest links and being unable to utilize its own recovery capacity to turn around. So the idea of this division into three levels connects us to the understanding of fragility. So what is effectively this virus or any other virus? It's a specific shake of the system. So in order to see it better, I use this simple graph by having the idea of the fragility index, which goes from zero to minus one. Zero means the system experienced some shake and then nothing really happened to it. It kind of it got a little fluctuation and got back to where it was. The index of minus one, fragility index of minus one, no. means that the system got from shake to shock and actually went into the destruction. It doesn't return, the person passes away. So everything else is in between. So therefore, obviously, the less the system is shaken and the faster it comes back to its original state, having the complete recovery, the less fragile is the system. And on opposite, the more of the after shakes following the first shake it has from within and the more difficult for the system is to turn around and start the recovery, the more fragile is the system. So once we put it this way, it's actually quite easy to see how would this entire understanding would apply to these children with cerebral palsy. So let's recall the five levels of the GMFCS. So gross motor function classification system. So level one, that's the lightest, mildest. So this is supposed to be the child who barely see the physical differences with the healthy one. Level two, that's the child who is fully capable of his own sort of self-servicing, has close to normal activity level and general fitness, but experiences some deformities and troubles with the hands or the, or with the, either with one hand or particularly with, with the other. Level three, that's already the situation when the child is mainly in the wheelchair and has serious challenges in control of the leg, but sort of has some control of the torso and the arms. So level four, that's already the tetraplegic or quadriplegic condition. So everything is affected and even the troubles with the head control, they're obvious, but the, hand, the child can, for example, navigate the motorized wheelchair. And the child level five is effectively but mostly bedridden. And even the even the wheelchair there would be pretty much like a modified bed, right? And quite obvious that the level of general fitness lies. That's why if we just go by general fragility, we can say that the level three and four children, like milder forms of four, especially when the level four children are younger, they're kind of mild. So that would be corresponding somewhere to the numbers or to the fragility levels of the group, which is like goes 50, 60 and 60, 70. Again, our point here is not to pin down the exact number, but to feel the difference in magnitude, like the proportion of the risks and the significance of the situation. So that compared to the milder cases, it's like a five times increase. And then the next three to five times increase would be in the group of this super fragility. So and that would be the group of the level four and five, especially when we talk about the kids for the level four who move into their like puberty and further. So therefore we can divide the thing into this classes. So relatively robust, fragile, and the super fragile group. Super fragile. So that's what we are dealing with. Fact is, great majority of the ABR families, they're here. 30, 70, 40, 60, about this proportion, but that's really the situation. The proportion between the fragile and the super fragile. We don't have that many families who are in this robust category. So once we understand this, that should help you to get the connection with the statistics. 
And that, of course, once you realize that, that means that the kids from the level 3, 4, and 5, their risk significantly higher than for the ordinary population. So, one more important thing that we have to get is this relationship between yes. how, you know, like now we understood the structure within that case, the cases of the coronavirus, but we have to sort of connect it to something understandable and that with what we know from experience, you know, because we live life as usual, Despite there are some illnesses and diseases being in the background, right? Ah. So, like the regular flu Como epidemics, they are happening every year throughout all the countries. And some of the people who are saying, well, this whole coronavirus is not such a big deal, actually pointing out that, well, the numbers are not that great and not that different from the regular flu. So, I went on to look at some statistics to get the better idea of what is what. So the global compiled number is this. Like if you take a country like United States, so grow globally, and you're going to have about 30 million people having this flu on a yearly basis, and approximately 20 to 30,000 of them would not survive. So that gives us the average mortality rate of 0.1%. Do you understand it? It's like one out of thousand, right? But that's a global rate. What we looked at here, what we were more interested for this coronavirus, is distribution is that between the fragility groups. So, I looked it up, and the statistics is normally given per 100,000 of population, but I just made a conservative assumption that approximately 10% of the country population has the regular flu every year. Actually, it wasn't like conservative, it was an optimistic, because 10% is the, about the minimum. So, once I've done this recalculation, what we see is that even for the milder groups below 40, where the coronavirus shows us 0.1-0.2%, the regular flu numbers are 10 times less. And this proportion so far keeps through the other age groups and the other fragility levels as well. I wouldn't bug you with too much details, but you can really see it here that that's approximately plus minus the 10x ratio. So we have two things to consider. So even though really it's not the plague where the numbers would be super high, attack on mankind, but we can see that overall throughout all the groups it looks that this coronavirus thing is 10 times worse than the usual flu. And the second thing is that within it, we have that distribution between the fragility uh, levels, where with the higher fragility, the problems increase. So what's the conclusion for us? The conclusion is that this thing probably should be taken seriously. And because once the person kind of contracts it, that's 10 times worse than the regular flu. And that's not even talking about the fact that now there is a, like in the countries worst affected, the system is overflowing and there is a bottleneck effect. So there are just not enough of the emergency rooms and the abilities to deal with the people in critical conditions. And you see what we were talking about before were the mortality rates. So which were like 0 0.2, 1.4 and so on percentage. But actually if you want to put this whole thing on the experiential level, you have to look at two more numbers, which is the percentage of the critical and severe conditions. Currently that doesn't look good at all. So in a way what we see that almost 20% make the cut. I mean, get into this group. I mean, severe, by definition, is already quite a sort of super stressful experience for yes. the entire family. So that would include the fever, that would include, you know, let's say, the oxygenation dropping below 93%, you know, 30 breaths or more per minute, so, and lots of other troubles around. So again, of course, most of the kids, you know, or most of the people survive through that, but that's a serious condition. And of course, what we just still don't know no is the, how well the whole thing recovers. But we'll get to this later. So, if we put these factors together, it should 
as I said, take the preparation for this whole thing quite seriously. Come on. You see, what I really want to bring in is this important understanding. Because that diseases today yes. are going global, whilst immunity is local. So what does it mean? See, if you take some of the like worst examples in history and most known, so when the conquistadors landed in on the Mexico shores and so on, they brought with them their own pathogens. So, and the indigenous population with the local immunity wasn't ready for those kind of diseases to which the Europeans of that 500 years ago, which was the regular base. So we grew up in all, everything, you know, sterile, sanitized conditions. So, you know, if you land one of us somewhere in the middle of India, we are pretty much guaranteed to get all sorts of things. You know, stomach, lungs, intestines. So, meaning that our local immunity is not very fit for the global challenges. So that's why when people ask, you know, well, shall we escape to some remote village and sit there for half a year or a year when this whole craziness... Unfortunately, that's probably not the best advice for that current level of challenges that we can see from this coronavirus thing. So it's not that bad to run away from it, but it's bad enough to Pero si know, lo be malo. a challenge. Because, you know, if you run away from the city, schools and everything, at some point you have to return. And if you return, you're going to get exposed to all that of pathogens which are surrounding you. So to which when you're in them, you're quite immune. But if you escape and return, you're looking for trouble. So that's why the escape is a, not really a solution for now. So, but if you look at the scenarios of reach for this coronavirus thing, so far, Hasta the ahora. estimates, they are like spread, have a huge spread from the realities of the current reach. So if we take from the European countries, Italy, so which is worst hit but has solid statistics for it. So roughly speaking, they say 15 million people who are in that quarantine zone, and there are about say 15,000 cases. So, so far this number is just one out of thousand. Remember, we talked about the regular grip, you know, regular flu, which was one out of 10. So far this number doesn't look too bad. You know, if the whole thing stays that way, you know, the risks are 10 times lower than with the regular grip. So that's an optimistic scenario. In this case, you, can say, well, you know what? It's even less challenging than life as usual. I should live life as usual. Scenario number two, that this whole thing reaches approximate percentages of the regular flu. Mm, that's about, say, about 10%. So hundreds un... out of thousands. That is a less encouraging scenario because we understood that so far statistically it's kind of 10 times worse than the regular flu so we are getting like 10 times the increase of the risks and then there are also this messages that some people believe that it's actually going to reach up to 60 70 percent of the population well that statistics is not looking encouraging at all so this is the spectrum of thoughts y este es el and opinions, de... but it's up to you to choose which scenario to, you know, use as a guidance. But then we also have a lot of questions which are still open, like how good is the recovery after this coronavirus thing? You know, what's, how much does it weaken the lungs, how much does it weaken the system and so on. So but basically, so... what's going to happen to the system from the perspective of its future performance and its future uh, fragility resistance. We don't know yet. Chances are it could be worse than the regular flu as well. There's another set of questions that what about the repeat exposure to this particular virus? To this regular flu, it only reaches 10% of the population because once we had it, we develop a sort of reasonable immunity, multi-year immunity to a group of strands. So there is an opinion now that this particular coronavirus thing, that we don't form that long-term immunity towards it, so that so-called T immunity, so and we can only build the B immunity, which lasts only a few months. So these questions are still open, 
And if anything, they can actually increase the risks and bring the whole fragility further. And of course, there is this big question that we always have to keep in mind. Diseases go global, immunities are local. So this thing came out of China. Next time it could be something else from somewhere else. And how ready are we? So you see what I'm trying to do is to bring you the accurate statistical account of what kind of risks we are exposed now with the children who are in a higher fragility bracket. As I already said, the decisions on how to behave in this situation, they are yours, but when we talk about yours, yours within your household. Quite obvious, there is a health authorities who define how the whole country moves and shifts and remains in quarantines. But the main problem is, they, there are two main kinds of advice. Well, advice number one is, if your condition gets severe, you'd be admitted to hospital, hopefully, if there is not a bottleneck in your particular country. So far, most of the people who are officially diagnosed, they're just sent home, hoping that their defensive systems of the body are going to be good enough to handle the condition. And we understood that was handling the shake to the system. So I think it's logical to ask the other question. So because this second advice from medical profession today is non-specific. You know, just drink more liquid, stay at home, don't do stupid things. So and obviously I would always join the yep. people say, telling you don't do stupid things. But don't do stupid things is not equivalent to do smart things. So that's exactly what we are trying to address with ABR. How to give you extra tools and strategies for doing smart things, which would prepare the best possible base to kind of serve as the anti-risk. And that's a really important thing to understand, that when we discuss it, we discuss it from the perspective of the anti-fragility not from the perspective of getting specifically ready for this particular coronavirus. You know, nobody has any specific vaccines or anything like this. That's, in that respect, there is no particular preparation for that particular thing. And it's not going to appear in the next months, if not years. So that's why the understanding of the system is so important. We already understood two big things. This particular virus is a stronger shake to the system than the regular flu. So we looked at the numbers, it's a 10 times stronger yeah, shake to the system. If this is a 10 times stronger shake to the system, so that means that the risks of the system going from shake to shock, they are significantly higher. So therefore, what we need in first place, we need to check for the most vulnerable systems, the ones that are most likely to get into that shake to shock situation and focus on them. We ask ourselves how we can prepare them Pregunta. as much as possible for the potential shake. And then ask ourselves a larger question, not only how we can prepare the most vulnerable system, but how we can prepare the entire system of the child's body and health for this ability to mobilize itself to withstand the shock and to be able to kickstart the recovery process. So that's really the practical question. So once again, this is not a specific medical advice. It's not specifically related to this particular strand of the coronavirus. The specifics that we need to know about it is that it's 10 times at least riskier than the regular flu. So from my perspective, it's worth taking a pause and give it a serious consideration. So let's look at the strategies that you can choose in this situation. The situation number one, escape. Either it's escape, like literal escape, to the woods, to the mountains, Alles whatever. Worst. But that's what I already addressed, because immunities are local and the challenges are global. Moving into the pure places, you always face the question of what happens when you return. So it's just delayed trouble. So you're not taking the risk away, you're not reducing the risk, you're just postponing and actually increasing. So, the more realistic situation number two, you keep your rehabilitation life with your child as usual. So what does it mean? Unfortunately for a lot of you, it still means this kind of Paralympic focus, so or this heroic focus, pushing the limit. 
when you're always late, when you're always short on time, when you always want to squeeze more into the child's life, more training, more teaching, more entertainment, and more useful things in general. So that's life in high gear. So super mobilized and intense life. So that's in that respect, you can say, you know what? You know, that's the only life that's worth it. You know, I'll take the risks. So the strategy number two would be to say, hmm, you know what, Mr. ABR? I hear a message that even though I genuinely want to live life in high gear, I realize that it's a good thing to change my focus in this 2020 and get the particular switch of my resources and time to try to get the most out of those systems that kind of most fragile and most exposed for the potential risks of the coronavirus. So that means that you're ready to put your focus into the specific respiratory preparation and boost. And then, of course, you know, getting further with the, shall I call it, the detox program, the relaxogenic program, and so on. And the thing that I actually would also be talking about more in the future, to a great extent, I think that as risky as it is, this whole situation with the coronavirus is a wake-up call, which exposes how vulnerable is the regular life, this regular, regular intense life, shall I say. The life, the heroic life, which is focused on, on uh, schooling and functional training. And I'm looking at it that maybe some of you would look at it and say, hey, maybe we need to cool down, look at the fundamentals, and make a child more robust, less fragile, and take this as a priority, as opposed to pushing their performance limit. So that's just a brief note of the three strategies. But I believe that the practical part is very clear. So what we need to do now as the action plan. The action plan is the plan of all this coronavirus thing is that we have to really focus on to the special set of the respiratory programs. See, if we look at our sort of standard set of ABR approaches and strategies, you know, when I'm defining this strategy for your child, I'm juggling a lot of different balls. You know, how to reduce fragility, how to deal with the particular, let's say, problem focus areas like the hip, so how to improve the hand function, get the seating things and all this hey, stuff, right? Okay. More typically, I have to formulate the priorities, you know, with a certain push, maximum push towards the functional outcome. Because that's how you would normally judge the like, benefit of ABR for your chat. But that's kind of more external side, right? So what we really want to do as a change for this year is this emergency situation is to use the flexibility of ABR to switch our focus so that in this year we take this coronavirus threat seriously, this increased risks, increased risks of whatever, everything from mortality rate yeah, to the severe and uh, you know critical conditions, yeah. troubled recoveries and so on. So my suggestion to you, when so far the pandemic measures are still in development, but it looks that most of the countries are going to several months of kind of lockdown. So that is going to disrupt the usual life, of course, where you're going to spend a lot more time at home. So my point is that in this trouble, there is a hidden opportunity. First of all, the focus on boosting and improving the respiratory performance gives you a good basis in the anti-risk. Again, I'm not saying that it is going to prevent the exposure no? to this particular coronavirus, okay, well, yeah. but we're looking at the very tangible mechanical thing. See, let's start with simple examples. Say pectoral muscles. Pectoral muscles are double use. If you practice, I don't know, standing on the elbows or trying to encourage your child to crawl or do all sorts of this kind of things, your child is using the pectoral muscles mainly for the static support. That's one use. But the same pectoral muscles, they are at the same time a big part of your respiratory system. But especially for a CP child, if you try to get the static and dynamic, the static and the functional usage of the pectoral muscles, you're taking away their respiratory contribution. 
when your channel gets on the elbows or tries to get the crawl, these muscles get tighter and they're eating away Easy. the respiratory capacity. So as I discussed it here, in the regular situation, you might say, okay, Mr. Bloom, I hear you, but in my personal priorities, you know, the functional use is more important. You know, I can give you some of my time and some of my effort towards the respiratory part, but function is the most important. So what is my point? My point is that today with the increased risks, the smart strategy is for 2020, we have to activate as much as possible the resources towards the respiratory system. It means that we have to reduce the usage of this, say, pectoral muscles in the non-respiratory use and maximize the contribution that they would do right away to the respiratory system. Same thing goes, say, for the intercostal muscles. The intercostal muscles, what are they doing? Are they maximizing the chest expansion and thus the respiratory drive or the child is using them for you know supporting the torso when trying to learn something or when you know like being actually focused on schooling so again in right, nice. your situation you might tell me i see your point mr bloom you know i'm trying my best with the supplementary role of abr but the school is a larger priority for me in that sense i'm able i'm ready to trade some of the respiratory contribution of the intercostals for the greater static use in the, say, during sitting in school. And again, my point is, guys, school's probably going to be closed for weeks, if not for months. So you're at home. And this is a situation of a potential crisis. So it makes sense to maximize the respiratory use of the intercostal muscles. That's a simple logic. Special situation, special 2020, special focus. And the same is true for diaphragm, for the posterior ribs, for the trapezius, for the shoulder blades, you know, for the serratus anterior, and so on. And also, you know, like for the interplay between the abdominal and the, and the pelvic, uh, abdominal pelvic and the chest cavity. So, e that's the first level. But even within ABR, see, I have the ability to tune. So, also, within ABR, I can tune the focus on what we prioritize. So, therefore, we have two levels of juggling. One is that between everything functional and ABR, where I invite you for the 2020 to really increase the ABR percentage. But the second thing is that within ABR, we will do some shifts. So, because, again, I can juggle things differently, and when things go regularly, you know, we can focus, say, on the knee joint or on the, on the shoulder or on the, like the hip or and so on. Cadera, etc. But in this particular situation, we need to do the extra focus on the respiratory can on the respiratory contributions. So, of course, everything we do with ABR has some part of the respiratory contribution. This time around, as this special emergency protocols to maximize your channel's preparedness for potential shake but to the system and like which tends to gear towards the respiratory vulnerability that's where we need to reshuffle your program and get this extra focus now you might ask me that sounds all good and yes it's a good plan but with the own with this lockdown of the countries how are you going to teach us that so the good thing is first in the last few months, we've been really experimenting a lot with the online programs and, you know, with improving internet speeds and camera qualities through all the calidad. This is becoming easier and easier and easier. And, of course, as we practice that, so you know, we develop the additional expertise in how to structure this program. On the other hand, the introduction of the new tools, vibration tools in particular, is really, I would say, it's great timing. On the one hand, it's going to help us a lot in maximizing the effectiveness of our work with the respiratory system. On the other hand, these respiratory tools or these the vibrant tools, they're very much online friendly. So we can teach the usage of those quite easily in the online format. So that's why I feel very like quite well and quite prepared for this like coming situation so that even this physical lockdown of the borders that might happen within the next few weeks is not really going to cause any disruption or troubles in our ability to help you with the preparation for this 
coronavirus chilling. So, and then, therefore, on this physical level, this is really the first point. So we want to optimize the current programs that we'll be prescribing in the next several weeks towards maximizing this physical component of getting the respiratory impact. And also, this is a good time to bring the next level of conversation. So where we can bring more in the online communication format, starting with the videos like this, and then going further towards the question and answers, regular Pero sessions, haciendo... where we will discuss the different specifics of rehabilitation life and your rehabilitation parenting, so how we can balance those in such a way that we move from this Paralympic and heroic mindsets into being even more systemic, strategic and really like trusting the developmental capacity of the child. So that's really the summary of my message. And I do think that we have to take the current situation seriously. As I've shown you, as we go through the risks, they're 10 times greater compared to the regular flu. We also realize the level three, four and five children who are the dominant majority of the ABR families are the children who are the most fragile. And that's why for those, we have to look at the like numbers of the senior citizens as the reference one. You know, when we want to understand the true, the true magnitude of the risk. And I think that it's still not in the domain where we should like get into panic and, you know, run away from this planet. In that sense, I believe that the balance of the risks and the awakeness that this entire situation with coronavirus brings is actually positive in the long term. It makes us look into the mirror, reevaluate the situation, and really kind of bring the question of the is bring the established routines into question and remote and overhaul. So, and in that on that road. I would be more than happy to hear more from you, to get the specific questions and Recibir concerns. And at the same time, from the practical side, yeah. you know, really in the next weeks, focus on getting the new updated respiratory informed or respiratory focused ABR programs. So we are more than available in all sorts of the online connections. You'll find all the links below and inside this video. So please get in touch if you have any, like, you should have si, further questions si than how que you in the world. And this video is just kind of the first one in the whole series of the, you know, of the uh, videos that I'm going to make to help you with the entire, like, rehabilitation life and rehabilitation parenting in these challenging times of the increased risks of 2020. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. And I'm looking forward to your feedback.